the true thinking behind functional medicine needs to be, let me evaluate the entirety of this person, including their childhood experiences, including any infections that they've had, including major pharmaceutical regimens they've been put on because that can change your gut biota and your body for life. Let me figure out all those things, piece this complex, expanded human together and understand why they might have a part of their body that is an Achilles heel more than somebody else's. Welcome to the Fire, Soul, and Grace podcast. I'm Dr. Christy Tompkins, functional medicine practitioner and transformational coach. If you are looking to up-level your health in body, mind, and spirit, scale your business, improve your relationships, and create a life you love, you are in the right place. Every other week, we'll bring you a topic and feature incredible guests worldwide. Be inspired and feel empowered to live your life with greater joy, meaning, and purpose. I'm excited you're here. Let's get started. Hello, and welcome to the Fire, Soul, and Grace podcast. I'm Dr. Christy Tompkins, and today I have a really special guest with me. I have Dr. Christine Smith. Uh, Dr. Christine Smith is a functional medicine practitioner and doctor of chiropractic with a background in cognitive neuroscience. She specializes in holistic injury recovery and chronic inflammation prevention to help active people come back stronger, uncover hidden injuries, and prevent re-injury. She does this by teaching clients how to use recovery time as a gift to restructure lifestyle priorities, to learn to speak the language of their body through education rather than medication, and heal beyond the scars. So welcome, Dr. Christine. How are you today? Thank you. I am great, and I'm so excited to be here. So thank you for having me. Yeah, I'm excited too. So Dr. Christine and I are colleagues. We both live in the Colorado area and we have uh, belonged to a mastermind mentorship group as well and a few other a few other um, ties that we have, some meditation groups as well. So I am I'm really excited to talk with you today because I think you're just a um, a very unique wealth of experience and education. So your background, um, you're a chiropractor, and your background, you have a very interesting background. I was looking at your your website. So you have this uh, passion or specialty in cognitive neuroscience, and I see that you did some training with the Amen Clinic as well. So tell me a little bit about what led you to, first of all, chiropractic care, and then what led you down the neuroscience pathway? Yeah, no problem. You know, I guess it actually started with neuroscience. So that was my um, undergrad specialty. And I was originally in biology. I was thinking I was going to do research and even, you know, stem cell research. And then I got more into the psychological side of things and added on a double major. And then I had an experience for myself where I used to really struggle with stress and anxiety. And, you know, anyone who struggles with that and is in college or graduate level school, it tends to come out during those times. And I ended up having a very gentle hands-on treatment done by a PT who specialized in basically neurological physical therapy. And with that, he essentially reset my nervous system. And it was the first time I'd ever had body work done like that. And it completely changed my anxiety and my stress levels and You know, I'd been trying to work with the conventional system, which had recommended different pharmaceuticals, and I completely stopped everything and felt like a totally different human. And from that experience, I was like, I need to understand what you just did to me. So I ended up uh, putting on the cognitive neuroscience specialization and working in a variety of uh, psychological research labs and also worked uh, in a research lab at the University of California, San Diego Medical School. And just learned a ton about the brain and cognitive reserve and what allows our brain to operate in different networks. And so then I just discovered I really wanted to understand the brain more and I wanted to understand the nervous system. And I considered going to medical school for neurology and I um, considered going to, into psychology. But I just, after undergrad, I took some time to reevaluate what I wanted to do and to really think about it. And that led me into traveling and doing some volunteer work abroad and seeing how other cultures view health and learning from old ancient healers like shamans and then also working in hospital systems abroad in another country that had 
acupuncture wings in their hospital. And it just gave me this overview effect on how we view health and how we can get stuck in one way of viewing it. And then I came back and I ended up working in an integrative office uh, headed by a chiropractor that did functional medicine. And that office had a variety of practitioners all working together for really complex cases that would be feeling better in just a couple months because of the functional medicine approach. So then I wanted to understand that more. And picking a degree was tough. Um, I interviewed a lot of different practitioners that looked into naturopathy, looked into physical therapy, occupational therapy, neurology, medical school, osteopathic school, chiropractic school. And um, I ultimately just had to choose one. And I ended up choosing chiropractic because their entire focus is your nervous system. And I also chose it because of how you are educated to think about health. It is taught in the salutogenic model, which is let me find everything right with you and bring it out instead of let me find everything wrong with you and suppress it. And that just seemed to resonate with me and my interest and intrigue in biology because to me, the reason I went into biology was the idea of life and growth and these things that happen with no instruction. And to me, that seems like something to facilitate that innate intelligence that is in all biological systems. And uh, that's where I kind of just fell in love with understanding the nervous system from a health-oriented perspective and dove into it in a more sustainable way. And then I ended up doing the Dr. Daniel Amen Clinic's Brain Health Coaching Professional Program, which is looking at the brain from both a neurological imaging perspective and a nutritional perspective. So I really appreciated the brain-specific nutrition that they brought into things. Um, and so I'm just, I'm always constantly studying the body and the nervous system from different perspectives. And I think people tend to separate our brain and our nervous system, but they're not really separate. Your nervous system is just an extension of your brain that goes through the rest of your body. So to me, that's how I like to perceive it. And going through that experience with the stress that I mentioned at the beginning, that was something that also taught me that stress is stored as chemistry in our nervous system and in our body. And that made me think dramatically differently about um, traumatic experiences and, you know, people like veterans or anyone who's been through trauma and abuse and how to actually address those things. Because I think so many of those people have been tried to help in so many ways and it just hasn't worked for them. So when I started approaching things from a bodywork approach, which the, which was the other reason I got a chiropractic degree is I wanted to be really good at not just knowing what to touch on people, but knowing how to touch people. And I wanted to be allowed to incorporate bodywork into my care because I think touch is something that's really been lost from our healthcare system. And I have patients that'll come in with nutritional deficiencies. And now that I know and understand what I know about the nervous system, sometimes I don't even start with nutrition or a complex plan because their brain and their nervous system is in a place where they can't integrate it. So I'll actually start with body work first to allow their system and their body to enter a more receptive state so that when we do work with nutrition, they can actually absorb the nutrition or when we're working with a complex plan, they can absorb the ideas. You just touched on so many beautiful things. I love, um, I loved all of that. And what I, what I think is really interesting about chiropractic care is that there, there's still a lot of misconceptions about what a chiropractor does. And I know every chiropractor has their own specialty and their own passion. And, um, but I, I think a lot of people think that it's, it's, um, you know, changing the bone structure or the physical structure of the body um, and whatever terms they give that. But there, it's so much more complex than that. And I think being able to not only touch the body, because you're also um, stimulating um, or helping support oxytocin, connection. Of course, there's lots of, you know, serotonin, especially in the last few years. I mean, I just went to a gathering over the weekend um, actually, Christine and I went to another community gathering, which I want to de definitely talk about the impact of community in health and healing. But just I went to go hug somebody goodbye, and I didn't know her, and that's okay. And she said, yes, I'm I'm hug deprived. And she was kind of joking, but I don't think she was. And I think a lot of us 
in our society are like touch deprived and you might have a family member or you might live with your your spouse or your kids or maybe even a roommate but i think just having that human to human touch is just i mean you don't even have to say any words and that has such a profound healing um impact on the body but with with the chiropractic care you're you're doing so much because you are shifting things yes structurally but you're also shifting things chemically you're shifting things n- neuronally and then uh, hormone wise and neurotransmitters and there, there's a lot more that's going on when you are focused on the the physical hands on treatment with a client oh very very much so and you know, I will say there's a spectrum of chiropractors and I tend to be on one end of the spectrum where I mix a lot of modalities, but there wasn't a degree in holistic healthcare. So I picked the degree that let me do the things that I wanted to do without having my hands tied by overarching corporations. And for the physical care, I mean, there's so much that you're doing. And I think people always associate it with cracking and like violent movements, but yeah, I adjust newborns. Because coming through a birth canal is a really intense thing for your neck. (laughs) And so, you know, I make sure that that is all happy for them and I check their reflexes. And for kids, it's so neurologically focused. Like a lot of what I do for tracking their development is I check their primitive reflexes, which a lot of parents have never even heard of. And I don't know why those aren't included in normal pediatrician exams. Like it's a very simple thing. We all learn it in school. And it's a really easy way to track development and make sure that their brain is developing correctly. And with pregnant moms and things like that, everything I do is super gentle and you don't have to be heavy handed. And I also work with giant CrossFit men and a lot of them will think that they need a really heavy handed adjustment. And sometimes when you're working your body out that hard, you actually need more like fascial and ligament work and you need something gentler that'll help your nervous system enter a restorative state so that you can properly recover because sometimes people think that they took a day off from the gym and they sat there and went, they watched TV and that's recovery. But that is not recovery. Like you need to get your nervous system into what's called an anabolic state, which is a building state. And that, you know, that's where body work can really help. So it can be cracking. It's a more traditional route, but it does not have to be. It's about facilitating your life force and making sure that the body is moving fluidly and that the muscles and the brain are communicating correctly and fostering all of that and the body's natural intelligence. And I work a little differently. I see people for, you know, 20 minutes is my short appointment. I prefer to see people for about an hour, but a lot of chiropractors will see people for five or 10 minutes and they just shift some stuff around and all of it works in different ways. It's just about what you need at the time. And I love my fellow practitioners and I will tell patients like, hey, maybe chiropractic isn't what your body needs today. Maybe you need more acupuncture or maybe you actually need to work with this physical therapist so that they can spend an hour going through exercises with you and watching your form. So I have referrals for all of those things. And I tend to build a team around my complex patients for when they need additional care. But in my office, I'll do a good amount of physical care for people who are good at doing exercise homework. I will give them that kind of homework. Um, but sometimes people need additional stuff. And that's when I reach out to my colleagues. Yeah. And I think it's, it's, and that's beautiful. Thank you. I think it's knowing when, when to refer out or when like, okay, I can help you. I can help you on this level and with this condition. But I mean, I definitely refer my clients to chiropractic care, acupuncture, um, a therapist, somebody that can do a little bit deeper emotional trauma work. Yeah. Um, and on the same topic of of trauma or trauma that's stored in the body, I, I think a lot of times um, when you are shifting things or moving the body in a physical level that a lot of emotions can come up <laughs> that a lot of people are surprised about. They're like, I'm at the chiropractor. Why am I feeling emotional? Why am I thinking about something that happened to me 20 years ago? I give people a heads up on that <laughs> because... Um, And I try to do it in a way where it's an opening, but not a guarantee so that whatever happens for them happens for them. Because, yeah, there's there's a a part of chiropractic that I've studied called biogeometric integration, and it's a more mm, philosophical and energetic theory and approach. And we call the concept you just described, that kind of stored emotion, as potential energy theory. So the idea is that when you do an adjustment in an area that's been stuck for a really long time, you release energy back into the body for it to have a second opportunity for to integrate that experience. 
And as I said earlier, it's like traumatic chemistry gets or trauma gets stored in your body as chemistry. And it can get stored in tissues or scar tissue or in your nervous system and how you perceive the world. And so you can look at it in a bunch of different ways. And I say, you know, I say I do holistic injury recovery because I think it is the most easily understandable thing for people. But then I retrain people on what they perceive as an injury because you can have an emotional injury like grief. And that emotional injury can then cause an injury to your intestines. Because I think a lot of people forget that when you have a intense emotional experience, it can actually cause an inflammatory reaction, much like a ankle sprain or a broken bone in your body. And then you can actually get permeability in your gut. And then you can actually get some leaky gut out of the grief that you just experienced. And then that leaky gut can cause other organs to dysfunction. So when I talk about hidden injury, that's what I'm talking about is tracking down you know, maybe that infection that you got years ago that didn't bother you until five years later, because then five years after you got the infection, you got super stressed out or you had another environmental exposure like mold or something. So there's all these different ways that things can come out. And that's when I'll work with people, you know, more deeply on the functional medicine side and nutrition, which not all chiropractors do functional medicine. Some of them are just really good at what they do and they just focus on body work. But for me, that just comes with that holistic health approach is, understanding that the body needs all of it. It needs like holistic care means emotional care. It means physical care. It means nutritional care, environmental care, all of it. Yeah. And you use the word emotional injury. And we talked about this a little bit, a little bit ago, emotional injury, like stress, like stress and trauma. And you bring up a really good point because you can have something, I mean, who hasn't had something traumatizing or upsetting that you think you've moved on, you think it's in the past and you think, oh yeah, I've, I've resolved that. And a lot of time, and, and, and truly some people really have, they've done the deep inner work and they really have, they feel complete with that. But for a lot of people, like they really just kind of uh, bury it. They push it under the rug because they have bills to pay, a job to do, they have, you know, school or whatever, a family to provide for. And it's so easy to just keep moving forward and, and think, oh, you know, I'll just forget about that. And it'll, time will heal all wounds. And it doesn't. And then it comes up in a chiropractic appointment or at a naturopathic appointment. I mean, sometimes people talk to me about things that they haven't thought about in decades. And then, then you can kind of see the floodgates open up and that emotion, um, emotions are coming to the surface. But you brought up a good point about how that can then lead to, um, of course, stress. We fill it in every cell of our body, but then that can lead to, of course, stress that now is being maybe not stored, but it's now focused in the gut or it can be focused on maybe your eyesight or something and how it kind of shifts from different organ systems and the term holistic at being able to really look at all the different organs, organ systems. And I love to share with people that I love to look at the body from kind of an Eagle bird's eye view, but also look at it from a very microscopic uh, cellular level as well. And it's being able to kind of integrate all the body systems to figure out what's going on here and how can we bring the most harmony to the body so that it can heal. Absolutely. And The bird's eye view that you just mentioned, you know, there's that concept that everything large is a reflection of everything small and everything small is a reflection of everything large. And when we're talking about these concepts and we're talking about how it can even lead into leaky gut, then you can get yourself stuck in a really funky cycle. Because let's say, and I'm just going to, you know, we talk about allostatic load too, which is the overall stress load on your body. And let's say you are just, you know, your average person. You got a family to take care of, you got bills to pay, you got groceries to pick up, you got places you got to be on time and you got to finish that project for work. It's a pretty average life for a lot of people. Doesn't necessarily mean that it's a relaxed life. So it's also very much about how you are perceiving your environment because if you're at your job and you perceive that you like your team, fine then when something stressful comes up, you're probably going to handle it a lot better than the person who hates their boss or hates their teammate. And it's going to be a lot more stressful for them. And so therefore that person might have a worse reaction than the person who perceives it as not that bad. So perception is a huge player in health. And I think if I had to pick the most important piece of health, it would be how you're perceiving your environment. Because if you 
perceive your family and all those things that you're doing as fulfilling and supportive, you're going to do great. If you perceive you needing to provide your fam- provide for your family as stressful and you haven't gotten to rest, and that is your perception of it, that's going to be a lot harder on you biologically. And when we talk about getting stuck in that terrible cascade, it's when something happens in your life and you perceive it as stressful. And it might very rightfully so be stressful, but it's all about how you perceive the situation. Like if you get in a car accident and you're like, eh, it's not that bad, you're probably going to fare better than the person who freaks out about it. Just like a little kid, right? If a kid trips and hurts themselves and you look at the kid and you don't react that much, you're like, oh, you're okay. Like you're going to be fine. They collect themselves much more quickly than if you freak out about it. If you freak out, they'll freak out. Your body's the same way. So if you go into a stress, like alert mode, I'm worried that the next shoe is going to drop and I'm under attack, your cells are going to do the same thing and your immune system is going to upregulate. Now, if that happens, and then you also get some leaky gut from this response, because that's just part of our inflammatory response. The way that our white blood cells travel to our other tissues is our tissues become more permeable. That includes your gut lining. Now, the other thing that I think a lot of people don't know about the gut that we talked about before that I think is fascinating and I think everyone should know is you actually have, I'll just call them bad bacteria, basically gram negative bacteria that can produce things called like LPSs that can be toxic to our bodies. They actually have receptor sites for our stress hormones, like adrenaline and um, epinephrine and cortisol. And when they sense that those hormones are around, they know it's a good time to grow. And our immune system is also depleted. So when you stress out, you actually grow a culture of toxic bacteria in your gut. And then if you have leaky gut, pieces of those toxic bacteria and things that they produce, like the LPSs, stands for lipopolysaccharide, go into the bloodstream, your immune system freaks out and attacks it. And then let's say that you have a little bit of leakiness, so a food particle of you know, dairy leaks through with that thing. Now your immune system is freaking out about the dairy as well. And then all of a sudden you have a food sensitivity to dairy that you never had before. And now you're consuming it regularly because you always have and you've been fine. But now you're getting this subtle inflammation because your immune system is reacting every time. And you have these little poisonous particles floating around in your blood. And then when you're inflamed, your brain does not operate as well. You tend to have less resilience. You get stressed out and anxious more easily. And then that perpetuates you being stressed out, which perpetuates the gut thing. So it just goes in this circle until you start to control it with either food or proper nutrition or preferably learning how to manage your stress on a more effective level. And that's important because if it goes on too long, then it can start to really affect your brain in bad ways. And you know, we, we seem to think that we are in this dementia epidemic and we have no idea where it came from, but exactly what I just talked about and then add in the cocktail of toxic exposure we have in our world that we don't even test how chemicals interact together. We only test them independently. No wonder we're all so overwhelmed and why our health is in a crisis for a lot of people. Like it's just a lot for our bodies to handle. Yes, yes, I totally agree. And you brought up something interesting about the food. So yes, the stress, which again, I don't think uh, this isn't, uh, it might be a bit more common in the integrative functional medicine, naturopathic, uh, chiropractic, um, maybe neuroscience fields where the chronic stress uh, or dysregulation of the immune system and the um, nervous system, how that can upregulate more bacteria, which causes dysbiosis, and that can cause gut problems for a lot of people. And then you add on top of that, you know, often when we're stressed, we go to foods that may not be healthy. I mean, I know when I'm stressed, I don't go grab celery <laughs> from the fridge, right? I might go grab something with some sugar or maybe another cup of coffee or you know, um, maybe some corn chips, so something that may not be all that healthy for me. And yes, I, I have the, the stronger willpower now to be able to say, okay, that's enough. Whereas when I was younger, like teen years, 20s, I probably would have, you know, eaten a little bit more, had more stress, not really understanding how the human body works. 
Um, but what's interesting is that the, yes, you, you may not have a dairy or a gluten allergy or an allergy to eggs or almonds. I mean, I do, I do some food sensitivity testing in my practice in addition to a lot of other functional labs. And what's interesting is when you have one sensitivity to say maybe one or two or three foods, and then you add in chronic stress, and then you add in um, maybe pharmaceutical medications, a history of antibiotics, a history of other, you know, antidepressant medications, other, you know, pain uh, medications, and that just makes it worse. And so maybe the food sensitivity might have been mild, but now it's blown up out of proportion because of that, um, that's kind of like pouring gasoline onto a fire. It just made it that much worse, which you talked about leaky gut or intestinal permeability. And now all of a sudden, now they've got chronic eczema. And they're like, how did I get, so, how do I have skin problems now or chronic acne breakouts or now their hair is starting to fall out of their head. And so that that tie in, that that deep connection, which seems like it's indirect, is is actually completely direct related to the chronic stress. Oh, absolutely. And it's so hard for people to turn that off sometimes. And you know, one of the things that I appreciate about the greater emergence of functional medicine is the way people think about things. Because you can sit there and you can diagnose something, you can know exactly what to call it. My question for you as a provider is, what is your actionable item for that patient? And that is what I struggle with a lot when I, you know, and like whenever people come in, I will always look over, you know, other labs that they've had done and everything. And there's so many labs that you can run and some of them are really expensive. And there's an argument about, you know, food sensitivity testing that it's silly because it changes all the time. It's like, okay, yeah, I get that. But it's my actionable item in this moment for how I can control your inflammation for free with what you're doing at home. So to me right now in the middle of your crisis, it matters because it is how we are going to start putting the fires out while we figure out what else to do. And there's a ton of different tests that you can run to figure out like what exactly what tissues people have autoimmune reactions to and all this stuff. And I think that can be handy to know exactly what's going on. But my question is the same. What's your actionable item? And so to me, I would rather understand what, immune, like which part of the immune system is overactive. And I want to know why it's overactive. So I'm going to check for infection a lot more often than I'm going to check for exactly what the immune system is tagging in autoimmune, because I want to know why it's overactive in the first place, rather than what it's doing immediately in the moment. Because if I can figure out what started the fire, that's how you put the fire out. And that usually always comes back to lifestyle because that's just how I work. And once you, once you operate and, and, you know, functional medicine, it's definitely a way of thinking because you can do functional medicine with a conventional medicine mindset where you see a symptom and you give a pill for that symptom. It's just not a prescription. It's a supplement. But to me, that's still just a band-aid solution. So the thinking, the true thinking behind functional medicine needs to be, let me evaluate the entirety of this person, including their childhood experiences, including any infections that they've had, including major pharmaceutical regimens they've been put on because that can change your gut biota and your body for life. Let me figure out all those things, piece this complex, expanded human together and understand why they might have a part of their body that is an Achilles heel more than somebody else's. So like you mentioned, skin and eczema, you can have eczema show up in a variety of different occasions from a variety of different causes. It's just how your body expresses inflammation. Same thing can happen with joint pain. Same thing can happen with hair loss. And I'll have people ask me all the time, like, well, what's the thing? What started this? What is, what's the thing I need to fix? And I'm like, well, we need to fix your inflammation and it can come from a lot of different places. So we may need to address a lot of different things and it may change over time. And so really what I spend a lot of time doing with people now is I re-educate them on the language of their body because our bodies speak to us pretty clearly. It's just no one really teaches that anymore and I don't really know why. And so that's why I like teaching people physiology and like if you wake up in the morning and you're four pounds heavier, 
you don't really just gain four pounds overnight. You probably ate something or drank something. People forget about the drinking part. You can drink they your do. issues. <laughs> and you probably did something in the last 72-ish hours, last 24 hours that upset your body. And you just need to review that. And maybe it was, you know, you ate bread and you don't necessarily have a gluten issue, but you're like, huh, I was puffy after I ate that bread. I wonder why. Maybe I just won't eat bread for the next three days until I'm not puffy and then I'll do it again. So it's like you give your body a chance to come back to baseline. It, and it's the foundation. Like you touched on nutrition. And of course, I know you're very much a proponent of physical activity and exercise. And I think for some people, yeah, they might come in looking for what's this herbal supplement or what's this uh, nutritional uh, capsule that I could take instead of my pharmaceutical medications. And it's not an easy swap out. Let's do this for this. And I think sometimes people have that expectation or that assumption. And yes, kind of going back to the whole person, but what are some easy, easy ish quotes, because some people don't think changing their diet is very easy or starting an exercise program is easy, but it's really about the baby steps. And that's what I always try to emphasize. Like, gosh, even if you just did 15, 20 minutes of something, uh, of a walk, or just let's just have you cut out this food for right now. Don't worry about, you know, 30 day elimination diet of take out these nine foods. Let's just start with one. And Maybe let's have you focus on your breath. Let's have you just like really kind of slow down your breathing and really just baby steps. And that in itself, especially, you know, over, over, you know, the repetition over time is enough to really decrease that stress response so that their body is now like, oh, thank God I can breathe. Thank God I can actually start to heal. Um, and it's really just showing people that the tools don't have to be expensive. Sometimes I even tell people we don't have to run all these tests because I, I mean, I've been in practice long enough that I can often not to say that I don't appreciate or value the labs cause I do, but a lot of times I can get what I need from the patient or the client just with what they share with me is their symptoms. And it doesn't always have to be overly complicated and take a long period of time. Sometimes it can just be very simple. Yep. Oh, I so agree. And I, you know, that's, I have an online program that I made that I'll send patients to sometimes just because I wanted to, one of the complaints I get is that functional medicine isn't accessible because of the cost. And I totally get that. Um, And I find, you know, a lot of my time is just spent educating people around things that I think should be basic knowledge, which is why I educate and do this kind of stuff is because I just want people to know these things. Um, But that program I made, it takes people through a five week cleanse of like learning how to listen to their body and they can do it on their own time. It's pre-recorded. It's just like something they can do. And then half the time they don't even need to come in because they've started to figure out how to regulate themselves. And if I can teach people that that's the whole, you know, teach a man to fish, you feed him for a lifetime concept. And I would much rather do that for people. And then if they still need help, then we can dive into the more complex stuff. But much like you, I can usually get a sense of what's going on. And I think that's, That is also one of the blessings of working in a non-prescribing field is when you don't have a prescription pad and a knife as your tool, you have to get way more creative and you have to really learn the properties of a lot of different things. And I, you know, I, a lot of patients are still on medication, so I still understand the mechanisms of action. But when I'm looking up a medication, I don't really look up what it's, always designated for, I look up the mechanism of action so I understand what it's doing physiologically with the cells. And then in that case, I can learn how to work alongside it or learn how we might be able to um, work in another way. And then that's something that I always have them consult their physician about. But I think it, it always comes back to just trying to support the body and thinking through how we can foster what our innate intelligence is already trying to do. So that's what I end up teaching people a lot about. And lab testing is amazing and great. And I definitely use it all the time. One of the other fun things I like to do in practice is I'll use applied kinesiology, which is muscle testing. And it's kind of treating the nervous system like a circuit board. And so you can go through and you can figure out different things that are stressing the body out on either a physical level or a chemical level. And that's a really interesting way to do things in office with people in between lab tests. So I can make a recommendation. I can suggest a supplement 
And then we can check in with their body and see, how are you doing with the supplement? Do we need to change our dosage? Do we need to increase it? Do we need to decrease it? And doing that in office is fascinating because the body is so dynamic. I will have people come in, they'll do really well with the supplement for a little while, and then they'll need a break from it. And then we shift and do something a little bit different, and then we'll come back to it. So it's like, I'll usually, you know, do some vitamin and mineral support just to make sure that their cells can operate. And then sometimes we'll do a probiotic or, you know, some, or like we'll do gut support first for a little bit, because not everybody knows, like you, if your gut is really upset, sometimes just pounding the probiotics is not actually a good thing because they are immune stimulatory. Um, but we'll work on the gut lining and then all of a sudden they don't need that gut lining support anymore. And then we'll do a probiotic and we'll do it for a little while and then they want to break and then we'll switch and then we'll switch back. And so it's this way of watching their body go through its dynamic process and its phases because it will move in and out of different states. Yeah. I think it's, again, it's just reminding people that they have, they have options. They have options and it doesn't always have to start from the top. We could just start, you know, very gradually. And, yes. um, and sometimes it, it will, it's, it might surprise them, but sometimes it even surprises me because they're like, yeah, I did, I did start to slow down. I did start to integrate these steps that you recommended and my body is actually feeling better. I'm sleeping a little bit better. Yes. And to come back, cause you had, yeah, you had, sorry, you had asked me about options. I will say, I completely agree with you that I think the fundamental things that you can focus on, like if you just drink water for a little while and nothing else, and you do some breath work and you meditate and you go for a walk like twice a day for at least 30 minutes and you sleep eight hours a night, You'd be impressed with how much better you feel. Yeah. And you're bringing up meditation. And I think sometimes that word <laughs> is very intimidating for people. And I heard something um, recently, actually, I heard it from Dr. Joe Dispenza. He said, we don't meditate to become spiritual. We meditate to change. We meditate to change something in our life. And I think a lot of people think, and not to say that it doesn't have a, a, a spiritual a connection or maybe goal in mind, but that the impact or the primary goal for meditation is to make some sort of change in your life, whether it's a personality or behavior or potentially heal your body. Yes, you can connect to um, to God, source, spirit, um, but I think for a lot of people, meditation might just be 10 minutes a day. It might just be a small amount of time to really get you to slow down and it doesn't have to be complex. It doesn't have to be anything fancy. It could be, it doesn't require anything that necessarily costs any money, um, but it could just be a, a, a reconnection with yourself so that your nervous system is able to slow down. You mentioned breath work and, and um, trying to just slow things down, which is so, so difficult for myself, but for a lot of people to really say, okay, I'm going to sit with myself for 10 or 15 minutes every morning or every evening or every, you know, at lunchtime, it doesn't have to be first thing in the morning. It, it could be any time of day and just that simple practice and maybe cha take the word meditation out and you could call it mental rehearsal, right? That's another great way to look at it. It's like, it's like, how do you want to be? How do you want to act? How do you want to appear? How do you want to live your life? How do you want to feel? And changing just a, a simple reframe or reshifting of those words and the time it takes and um, is enough to be just as impactful as drinking water and getting plenty of sleep. I mean, think about how amazing you feel when you have a really good night of sleep. Like it's like you feel unstoppable. It's like kind of going back to like the brain, the whole body is able to heal, but the brain is able to heal and replenish and it just makes everything so much more healthier. Absolutely. And, you know, people forget that people forget what the purpose of sleep is. The purpose of sleep is to clean your brain. And so, like, if you're not sleeping well, you're not cleaning your brain. It's like trying to go on a jog after you ran a marathon. Like, it's just not going to do as well. And when it comes to meditation, I'm glad that you brought up the word because I think that's a trigger word for people. And, I'm, and, I, and I, you know, I get it because, like, I have – been a meditator for a long time. I know how good I feel. I know how good it is for me. I know it's nothing but benefit for me. And I still have a weird resistance to it sometimes. And that is your old biochemistry fighting you because our stress chemistry is addictive because it is evolutionarily purposed for survival. 
So your body is going to have tendencies towards that. So meditation is like the gym for your brain. It's like physical therapy for your brain. It is you training your brain to operate in the way that you would like. And one of the other ways I've been referring it to it lately is sourcing. Like I just call it sourcing. It's resourcing. It is collecting and gathering your resources for yourself. It's like charging your phone or downloading updates. Like you can't really use your phone when it's downloading updates, just like your body. Like you have to set it aside so that you can download your updates to be the human that you want to be. But it takes practice and focus and also instruction. Like our brain is an instruction. Our hormones and our neurochemistry are signals and then our cells respond to that. But how you are showing up energetically, not even with just verbal thoughts, but like the energy behind your thought is the instruction that you're giving your cells. So if your energy resonates on the frequency of worried and stressed out, your cells are going to operate on the chemistry of being worried and stressed out. So if you can practice coming back to a state of calm and peace and joy and you know some people are like I can't remember what joy feels like it's been decades since I felt joy or I've never felt joy in my life focus on relief what does it feel like what is relieving to you maybe it's a bath maybe it's listening to music anything like that but that feeling of like oh I'm so relieved that I don't have to worry anymore it's like I just took off a backpack full of bricks and then you just sit in that feeling and you feel all your muscles relax that that was it that was the chemical shift so it's like focusing on that. It's giving your time to have a chemical shift in your body. Yeah. And you mentioned something um, really profound about the addiction to stress and how so many people, it's that's their norm and not just the, I mean, yes, it, stress depends on how, how the load you can carry. Because for some people, I think we talked about this the other day, how some people can carry a lot. And that's not necessarily stressful. And other people have just a few things happen and it just their whole world falls apart. And what's interesting is some people, that's just part of their programming. That's just part of their lifestyle. It's in their, it's in their biology of having chronic stress and they don't know what it's like to live a life of peace most of the time. Of course, we all have, you know, things we have to deal with and stress actually does help us grow and change and evolve and um, have in some cases have a better life. That's stress resilience. But when you have chronic stress that's depleting and and uh, catabolic to the body and it's actually harming the body, for some people, they don't know any different. And other than maybe when they go on vacation for a few days or a week and they feel great and then they come right back to their stressors, again, that's that whether you call it addiction and maybe I think for some people they're like, I'm not addicted to stress. I don't want to feel bad. But it's the programming, right? It's that autopilot programming of that's what the brain is used to. And so it keeps going. It, and it's almost like you try to find things that make you upset or stressed out or angry or irritable. And it's so fascinating to me how maybe warped might be a good word or dysfunctional at how we are like, oh, we have to go back to what we're, what's familiar, even though it's bad for us. Well, it's biology that hasn't caught up with society yet. So that stress response, it's a survival mechanism. Like it's, it's built in for a reason. And the reason it can be addictive is because it keeps you safe. So you can get addicted to being depressed or to being anxious because sometimes if you're an anxious person and then you're not anxious, you feel like something's wrong because you feel like you're not looking out for yourself especially if you grew up in an environment where there's a lot of stress present or, you know, unpredictability or chaos. And it's more important for those people to do these practices than people who grew up differently. And that has been shown in brain scans by pediatric associations where brains of people who have been through abuse and neglect literally do not have the same neurological functioning in their temporal and frontal lobes, which is your emotional processing, your reactivity, and your decision-making capacity. So meditation helps the frontal lobe grow. They've shown that after eight weeks of consistent meditation, you actually get more gray matter in your brain. And so you are actually reforming and reshaping your brain after those experiences. 
And essentially, you can think of meditation as becoming more resilient so that you have a higher capacity for when those things that are inevitable happen in life. And I kind of describe resiliency as the ability to resource and recover. And resourcing means, you know, pulling on your body's resources, whether that's nutrition or water or chemistry. But if your nutrition is terrible, you're going to have less resources available. And the other piece of that that I said is recovery, resource and recovery. Resiliency comes from having the opportunity to recover. So you have to figure out some time in your life to enter this recovery state, which means exiting the catabolic state, the breakdown state, which is your flying or, and like we need fight or flight. Like it's how we operate. Like you have a to-do list to do. That's part of your sympathetic nervous system, getting that done. But you have to come back to a place of balance so that you can enter the anabolic state and you can rebuild the resources that you just depleted. If you never do the recovery, you're not going to be able to resource properly and you're never going to gain the resiliency. You're just going to stay stuck in the unresilient state. So meditation, the lifestyle stuff, the stuff that people write off because they feel like it's a luxury, like, no, like go get a massage. It's actually really healthy for you. <laughs> so it's, Or getting outside. Yes, just, absolutely. Just a simple, you know, just beautiful springtime right now. So just getting outside and just even something like a 25 minute walk. I mean, it, it is very simple. And I have people that, you know, I have patients that they're like, they go to the gym, they work out uh, diligently several times a week. That's, those are quote my easier clients because they already have the foundational things in place and it's already part of their practice. It's like brushing your teeth or um, eating, you know, vegetables every day. It's just part of their, part of their diet, part of their lifestyle, I should say. And there's other people getting them to or influencing or encouraging them to just just move your body for a little bit. And not just moving your body, but really just that whole greenscape. I mean, I went for a hike this weekend uh, or yesterday, and it was so beautiful. And not just being outside in the sunshine and moving my body, and I had my dog with me, but just seeing the green around me and, the, and just taking in the beauty of all this rain and, you know, snow that we've had for the last six months and just taking in the beauty of nature, just that in itself was just very healing for my brain, for my nervous system, for my respiratory system with all the oxygen in the air. And so, um, again, just telling people that it can be pretty simple and something that can be done every day. It can be so simple. Like I have a half mile loop around my place and I do that probably two or three times a day, sometimes four. And it's just like my clearing my head walk because mm -hmm. for some reason, the way my brain works, like when I go outside, it's like I have like a lid like taken off of my head and all of my thoughts can just kind of spread out versus when I'm inside, I just feel like everything's kind of contained and a little overwhelming at times. So I use that walk to just kind of almost allow my body to transition states. And, you know, it's, I, I live in the suburbs, so that's fine. Or even if I'm, you know, at work, like I'll just go walk around the block really quick and come back, especially before meetings. That's a great way to prep your brain for a meeting. Um, but yeah, just taking that time to replenish and restore and recover. And, you know, I'll see it all the time and the athletes and the crossfitters and stuff, like, They'll come in and we'll work on them and then they'll leave and then they'll go get re-injured and then we'll work on that injury and then they'll go get re-injured. And if someone is consistently getting re-injured, it tells me that their body is in the breakdown state and they haven't had proper recovery. And I spend a lot of time working with athletes, helping them prevent injuries. And it comes back to the recovery state and the resourcing and the resourcing comes from your lifestyle and your food and your sleep and all of that. So it's, it's not, none of it's separate. It's all tied together. So if you're consistently getting re-injured or you consistently have some inflammatory things showing up, it means that you need to slow down and you need to get in tune with your body. And that's one of the other things that meditation can be for. Meditation, saying that you meditate is like saying you listen to music. Like that's such a broad statement. There's so many different kinds of meditating, but you know, some of it can be just going inward and being like, Ooh, okay. Like body, what's up? Like, where are you hurting? Where are you puffy? Where do you feel weird? And just waiting for your body to kind of be like, it's right here. And you're like, oh man, I didn't even notice how tight my shoulder felt. And then you go through, you do some movement in that area. 
doesn't have to be any specific stretch. It's just intuitive movement, like move in a way that feels good. If it doesn't feel good, don't do that. And it can be that simple and just giving yourself time to get in touch with your body and your inner world like that can really change your outer world. Yeah. And, and I think sometimes kind of going back to what we talked about at the very beginning, like the struct physical structure of the body, because sometimes we have, I mean, as you know, obviously you do um, far more hands-on work than I do. Just like when something is shifted in a way where um, your 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 gait changes, and you know, I tend to carry a lot of my bags on one side, and I, I it's such a habit with me. And I just I notice I tend to get certain injuries on certain sides of my body in the same places. Yeah. And you'd think, because I know a lot about the body, you'd think that I would make some changes and shift and maybe get some orthotics from my shoes and maybe change, you know, the arm that I'm carrying my bags on, or maybe like you said, go to a physical therapist or a chiropractor or um, acupuncture and really work on the physical body. But the body needs to have that shift as well, that physical shift in making making sure that structurally it can function better, not just so that you don't have pain, but just so that the the neurotransmitters and the fluids and everything else can flow a lot easier and kind of just reminding people of just that physical, the importance of the, the, the uh, maintenance of the physical structure of the body. Absolutely. And when it comes to exercise and stuff, I mean, it doesn't have to be like hardcore cardio. Like you can get really good cardio from weightlifting and your weightlifting can be yeah. really simple. It doesn't have to be like hit training all the time. Sometimes you actually need to recover from that. If you're getting injured, it means you need to stop for a little while and let your adrenal glands recover too, because people forget that they can push their organs too hard. Um, but yeah, those, those simple things just make a huge difference. And, and also just being kind to yourself about it and, you know, listening to yourself and also realizing those days when your brain is just doing the mental gymnastics to get out of the thing that you know is good for you because it just wants to like binge watch TV. Like some days, yes, you can just relax, but other days, sometimes we have to push through the, the monkey mind chatter. And, um, you know, and that's where going inward is helpful. And, you know, as Socrates said, like, know thyself, if you know yourself, and you know, like, I'm not supposed to be this puffy, or, you know, my skin has been more dry, like, those are just little signals where you can be like, okay, I need to, I need to step up my self care, like, what did I miss this last week? You know, I didn't sleep that well, or I actually did forget to exercise, or ooh, I only drank like one glass of water yesterday. And water is a big one for people. They forget that you can enter a fight or flight state from being dehydrated because it's a danger response for your cells. So if you are like in the middle of your day and you're doing fine, and then all of a sudden you get that like wired and tired kind of angsty feeling, that's your body. It just entered a little bit of a fight or flight state. So check your blood sugar, check your water intake, see what your body is asking for, because all of a sudden you just had a different chemical system kick on. Yeah, definitely. Definitely the water. And it's a simple thing to do. Uh, the rest and recovery though, is also key as well. When we talk about exercise and making sure you're, you're, um, focused on healing the whole body um, as much as possible, but just knowing when your body does need to rest. I had a day like that the other day where I was so tired and it was right around a time of my cycle and I was just feeling, I was feeling a bit depleted and it was late Friday afternoon, which, you know, technically, yes, I could have just said, okay, I'm done for the day. I'm done. You know, I need to start my weekend. And there was this other voice that wanted to keep working because I had a lot of things I wanted to get done. And I I had this like inner battle <laughs> between what I should do and what I wanted to do. And what I really wanted to do was just lay on the couch, rest, put a heat pack um, on my abdomen and just listen to music and just focus on my breathing. And that's what I chose because that's what my body needed. And I, it, I had to kind of fight with myself a little bit, but once I finally did, I was like, Oh my God, this is amazing to be able to say no to the thing that's actually going to make your body feel worse and make it feel even more depleted and saying yes to the side of you. That's like, yes, please, Christy or Christine, you need to rest. You need to slow down. And it's knowing when you need to, uh, what you need to do in that moment for your body. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's, you know, if I had one health advice, one piece of health advice for people would be learn how to listen to your body, because then you start to become your own health authority. 
And I think that's been lost in our society. And we need to remember how to be responsible for our, ourselves and our bodies. And, and also, you know, if you're in that state where you're stressed, 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 and you have to get this thing done, it's like, well, who, who's that stress for? Who are you getting it done for? Like, yeah, you can blame it on your boss or your parent or whatever, but that always comes back to you. And is the world really going to go into chaos if you take 10 minutes to lay down and listen to music so that your brain can become more productive? It won't. Like, it's okay. Totally. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And that, actually, that's perfect because I was going to ask you, what's one piece of advice that you would give to people or what's the most important thing you want people to know? And you just said it beautifully is know thyself and know what your body needs. Yep. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Christine. I love, I always love talking with you and I love um, getting to tap into your brain <laughs> at a deeper level. It's been a pleasure. So thank you so much for joining me today. Oh, thank you for having me. I always enjoy our chats. They're excellent every time. Awesome. Thanks, Christine. The views and opinions expressed in this program are solely those of the host and the guest and are not intended to provide nor are they a suitable substitute for professional care by a doctor, therapist, mental health professional, or other qualified medical professional. Thank you for listening to the Fire, Soul, and Grace podcast. Share this episode with someone in your life. Subscribe to this podcast so you can hear more valuable content on how to live your best life. Be sure to connect with us at firesoulandgracepodcast.com and please join us in the next episode.